Chapter 11, Part 3 of History of the Christian Church During the First Six Centuries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers. History of the Christian Church During the First Six Centuries by S. Cheatham. Chapter 11, Part 3 The Incarnate Son. The Arian controversy was critical and indeed vital for the Church, inasmuch as it concerned the very essence of Christianity. The whole scheme of redemption failed if the Son was not indeed from all eternity very God from very God. But it was equally true to look at the matter from the other side, that Christ could not be the true representative of humanity unless he were perfect man of the substance of his mother born in the world of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, so that God and man is one in Christ. The controversies then on the nature of the Incarnation, which followed that on the consubstantiality of the Eternal Son, were scarcely less important. So the opinions of Apollinaris, who denied to the Incarnate Son a reasonable soul, of Nestorius, who regarded the body of the Lord simply as an instrument moved by the indwelling deity, of the Monophysites, who either considered the human nature to be absorbed by the divine, or the two natures to be so mingled and confused as to form but one. All these had to be met and overcome in order to preserve the faith of the church. 1. Apollinaris of Laodicea, a keen opponent of Arianism, was led in the course of his dialectic to consider the union of God and man in one person. A complete man he held to consist of three parts, a material body, an irrational soul or vital principle animating the body, and a spirit, intellect, or rational soul, which includes not only intelligence but will. Now the third and highest of these could not, he believed, coexist in the same individual with the divinity. He taught, therefore, that in the Incarnation, instead of the spirit, intellect, or rational soul, the divine Logos, or Word, entered into a man. In short, the Incarnation was simply the entering of the Word into the living body of a man, which without it would have been simply animal. What in an ordinary man is the human reason and will, was in the Savior, the divine Logos. This doctrine soon attracted great attention. It opened a new line of thought and suggested new difficulties to those who wished to define exactly to themselves the great mystery of the union of the human and the divine in one person. Apollinaris's literary talent soon brought him many adherents. There can be little doubt that it was with reference to him, though his name is not mentioned, that the Alexandrian Council of the year 362 insisted that the body of the Savior was not an irrational one. The importance attached to the doctrine of Apollinaris is evident from the numerous refutations bestowed upon it by some of the greatest teachers of the time, which form now our principal authorities for the history of the Apollinarian heresy. Athanasius, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, and Theodore of Mopsuatia wrote against it. These theologians pointed out how perilous were the opinions of Apollinaris to the Christian faith, and controverted the expositions of Scripture by which he sought to defend them. Athanasius in particular insists upon the folly and impiety of attempting to define so ineffable a mystery as the union of God and man in one person. Even in an ordinary man, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not a thing explicable in the forms of human understanding. Theodore, as able in dogma as in exegesis, asserted vigorously the presence in Christ of a true rational soul. Without a soul capable of human suffering, how could he feel the agony in Gethsemane? Unless he had a human mind, how could he grow in wisdom? Growth of mind and mental agony imply the presence of human qualities, not merely of an animal body. There must therefore have been two complete natures, the divine and human, in the Lord. In the West also opposition sprang up to the new conception of the indwelling of the deity in Christ. Hilary of Poctier opposed Apollinaris in the spirit of Athanasius. Augustine also contended for the presence of a true human soul, not merely a vital principle in the Lord. There were two natures in his one person. But while Apollinaris's sharp definitions were generally rejected, 
There were probably many Orthodox believers who unconsciously read Apollinarian treatises under the venerable names of Justin Martyr, Gregory Thaumaturgus, Julius of Rome, and even Athanasius himself. Some of the adherents of the new sect were apparently not very scrupulous as to the means whereby they gave currency to their opinions. In the year 375, Apollinaris left the church and became the leader of a sect, which was one of those anathematized by the first council of Constantinople. He died fifteen years later, but his followers maintained themselves under various appellations, such as Demorites, from their recognizing in Christ only two of the three component parts of human nature, in spite of persecution by the state, until they were either reconciled to the Catholic Church or absorbed into the Monophysites. 2. The movement begun by Apollinaris soon caused further agitation. When speculation once seized on the great mystery of the union of God and man in one person, it was difficult for the fallible human intellect to avoid error, even when sincerely aiming at truth. The theologians of the Antiochian school took occasion from the controversy with Apollinaris to insist more emphatically on the reality and perfection both of the divine and the human nature in Christ. The most distinguished teachers among them, Diodorus of Tarsus and Theodore of Mopsuatia, insisted on the perfect manhood of Christ in their writings, which were held in the highest esteem in the Eastern churches. Thus Theodore taught that our Lord God, the Word, took upon him perfect man of the seed of Abraham and of David, of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, which man, like us in nature, fashioned by the power of the Holy Spirit in the virgin's womb, born of a woman, born under the law, he in an ineffable manner connected with himself. After the ascension, he receives the adoration of all creation, inasmuch as the connection which he has with the divine nature is an indissoluble one. These words, connected with himself, connection, which were thought insufficient to express the union of the two natures, were destined to bear a prominent part in controversy. The Alexandrians, on the other hand, inclined to exalt the Godhead in our Lord, even at the risk of diminishing the perfection of his manhood. They were accustomed, in fact, to speak of Christ as in all respects God, even during his humiliation, his emptying of himself on earth. Hence it is not very surprising that a Gallican monk in Africa, Laporius, who had taught not that very God was born man, but that perfect man was born together with God, was admonished to confess that the eternal Son of God, born before the ages from the Father, in these last days was of the Holy Spirit, and Mary, ever virgin, made man, born God. This was, in fact, to say that the Blessed Virgin was the Mother of God, and that epithet seems from about this time to have been commonly applied to her by those who favored the Alexandrian theology, as a protest against those who spoke of the divinity of Christ as merely connected with his humanity. Nestorius, who had been long a monk and afterwards a presbyter in Antioch, was in the year 428 raised to the patriarchal throne of Constantinople. He was, if not an actual pupil of Theodore of Mopsuatia, at any rate thoroughly imbued with the spirit of the Antiochian school. He was a pious and zealous man, but in the government of his diocese he showed, as might perhaps have been expected from his previous training, great stiffness and want of tact in dealing with men, together with too great readiness to persecute opponents. Give me, he exclaimed to the emperor in his inaugural discourse, a land purged of heretics, and I will give you heaven in return. Help me to vanquish the heretics, and I will help you to vanquish the Persians. With these views, it is not surprising that he set himself to put down all heresies without discrimination, to doubt the consubstantiality of the sun, and to celebrate Easter on the wrong day were in his eyes equally criminal. It was not long before he broached that opinion on the Incarnation which caused his fall. Anastasius, a presbyter whom Nestorius had brought with him from Antioch, declared from the pulpit, Let no man call Mary the mother of God, for she is a human being, and it is impossible for God to be born of a human being. It was not perhaps altogether unnatural, while men were vehemently asserting the Son of God to have been begotten of the Father before all ages, 
that Anastasius and others like-minded should have been startled to hear it affirmed that Christ, as God, was born of his human mother. But Anastasius's protest seems to have been misunderstood. It was taken as if the preacher had represented Jesus to have been a mere man. The excitement increased when a bishop, Dorotheus, who chanced to be in the capital at the time, exclaimed in a sermon, Cursed be the man who calls Mary the mother of God. And Nestorius neither restrained nor censured him. The question whether the title, Mother of God, could properly be applied to the Virgin Mary was from this time vehemently discussed by both clergy and laity. At last Nestorius himself intervened. In his teaching he rejected the disputed expression as giving rise to false conceptions, but he carefully guarded himself against the supposition that he denied the divinity of the Lord, and proposed to give to the Virgin the title Mother of Christ. While he was preaching a sermon in which this view was expounded, he was interrupted by a layman exclaiming, The eternal word himself submitted to a second birth. Thereupon arose a violent disturbance, as some of the audience took the part of Nestorius, while others sided with the layman who had interrupted him. Nestorius resumed his discourse, praised the zeal of those who had taken his part, and spoke contemptuously of the interrupter. In this excited state of public feeling, Proclus of Caesicus, on the invitation of Nestorius himself, preached in Constantinople on a festival of the Virgin. In the presence of the patriarch, he delivered a florid panegyric of the Virgin as mother of the incarnate word, and declared that those who refused her that title denied by implication the divinity of Christ. When he ceased, Nestorius himself spoke, and begged the assembly not to be dazzled by the brilliant oration which they had heard. He afterwards preached several sermons on the same subject, in which he explained in what sense he could accept the expression, Mother of God, and even went so far as to say that Mary was to be honored because she had received God within her. According to Cyril, Nestorius taught as follows, As the woman produces the body of her child, but God breathes into it a soul, and hence the woman cannot be called the mother of the soul, but only of the animal portion of the human being. So Mary bore the human being who was interpenetrated by the word of God, and is consequently not the mother of God. This was not satisfactory. The excitement grew stronger. A paper was displayed publicly in Constantinople in which Nestorius was compared to Paul of Samosata. A monk went so far as to attempt to hinder him from ascending the pulpit, thinking him a heretic and unworthy to teach the Christian people. And the fire which smoldered in the city was soon stirred by an impulse from without. Cyril of Alexandria was the most prominent representative of the Alexandrian school. Even before Nestorius was raised to the see of Constantinople, Cyril had expressed in a treatise on the Incarnation views not easily to be reconciled with his. When he controverted Nestorius, there was no doubt that he did so from sincere conviction. Yet it would seem that in the heat of controversy he attributed to his opponent opinions which he did not hold. He perhaps disliked him for his efforts to restore the fair fame of Chrysostom, and the conflict was embittered by the rivalry between the ancient see of Alexandria and the new throne of Constantinople. When he heard of the proceedings in the capital, he proceeded at first gently and cautiously, for Nestorius was in favor at the imperial court. Without naming him, he defended the use of the title Mother of God in one of his usual Easter pastorals, and also in an admonitory letter to the monks of Egypt, among whom were found adherents of the Nestorian opinion. By this second letter, which was widely circulated, Nestorius felt himself aggrieved. Cyril sought to justify what he had said in a letter to Nestorius, and the latter replied. After this, Cyril used his utmost efforts to strengthen his party in Constantinople, and to weaken the influence of Nestorius at court. Moreover, he brought the Western Church into the conflict by a letter to Pope Celestinus, in which he charged Nestorius with denying the divinity of Christ, and asserting that it was but a man who died for us. In vain, Nestorius explained that he was ready to style the Virgin the Mother of God, if that title was understood to refer to the union of God and man in one Christ. 
he was declared a heretic by a Roman synod. Celestinus charged Cyril to execute the decree of this synod, and if Nestorius refused to recant, to remove him from his see, an unheard of claim on the part of the bishop and a provincial synod of Rome. The support of Rome did, however, no doubt give confidence to Cyril, who went on his way undauntedly. He wrote to Nestorius a letter in the name of an Alexandrian synod, calling upon him to recant his errors, and subjoining a schedule of twelve propositions which were condemned. The most important point in these was, that the natural union of the two natures in Christ was insisted upon, and the notion of a mere binding together in one person condemned. Nestorius responded by a list of twelve condemned propositions of an opposite character, these were received with favor in the churches of Syria and Asia Minor, where Cyril's opinions were distrusted as involving a mingling or coalescing of the two natures in Christ. Theodoret, the church historian, at the suggestion of John, bishop of Antioch, wrote a special treatise to refute them. To remedy the confusion and division which arose, Theodosius II called a general council at Ephesus, to which both Cyril and Nestorius were summoned. Cyril, with his adherents, arrived first at the place appointed, and, in spite of the solemn warning of Isidore of Pelusium, refusing to wait the arrival of the Asiatic bishops, who had been detained on the way, and were still a few days' journey from the city, opened the proceedings. Nestorius, himself a member of the synod, was summoned as to a tribunal which was to judge him, and, on his refusal to appear, was condemned and a sentence of deposition pronounced against him. A few days after this, the Asiatic bishops arrived, and found to their surprise that the great question was already decided. They met under the presidency of John of Antioch, and passed the sentence of deposition on Cyril and his principal ally, Memnon, bishop of Ephesus. Theodosius, offended by the arrogant behavior of Cyril, at first confirmed all three sentences. In the end, however, Cyril, and Memnon were allowed to remain in possession of their sees, while Nestorius was compelled to withdraw to the monastery in the neighborhood of Antioch, whence he had come. The emperor, however, thinking there was no essential difference between the parties, was anxious for a reconciliation, for which John of Antioch and Theodoret also exerted themselves. Cyril did not formally withdraw his list of condemned propositions, but he agreed to accept a confession of faith, probably drawn up by Theodoret at the request of John. In this, the Lord is confessed as of a reasonable soul and a body subsisting, begotten of the Father before the ages as touching his Godhead, and incarnate in these last days for us and for our salvation of Mary the Virgin as touching his manhood. For there came to pass a union of two natures. According to this conception of union, without confusion, we confess the Holy Virgin, to be mother of God, because God the Word took flesh and became man, and from his conception united with himself the shrine, i.e. the human body, received from her. This formula was by no means generally acceptable to Cyril's partisans. Cyril himself and the emperor seemed to have been as anxious for peace as John and Theodoret, but a considerable number of the eastern bishops who favored Nestorius remained in opposition. Nestorius himself was about four years after his return to Antioch, driven from his monastery and sentenced to pass the rest of his days at Petra. It is probable, however, that this sentence was not carried out, as we find that he actually went to an oasis in Upper Egypt. There he was carried off by a wandering tribe, and, after being set at liberty, was dragged hither and thither by imperial officials until he died an unknown death. We have seen that the difference between Nestorius and his opponents was not so fundamental, but that men like Cyril on one side and John of Antioch on the other could discover terms of accommodation. But important matters did in fact underlie the controversy. It was not only the true humanity of the Son which was in question, but also the estimation in which the Virgin was to be held. When Nestorius asked, If God has a mother, why should we blame the heathen who speak of mothers of gods? He was an unskillful controversialist, and gave needless offense. Still, 
It was from this time that the process began, which in the end transferred to the Virgin Mary the old pagan title of Queen of Heaven. And in the Christological controversy, there is a real and important difference between the thoroughgoing members of each party. The Nestorian extreme is the recognition of two natures in Christ so distinct as to be incapable of forming a unity. The Cyrillic extreme is the conception of God clothed in flesh, abiding among men, God taking man's physical frame upon him rather than man's nature. For a human reason and will are essential to the completeness of man's nature. Nestorius by no means intended to make two persons in Christ. Cyril by no means intended to deny that he was very man. But in this case, as in many others, consequences were drawn from propositions which their authors would certainly have disowned. Nestorianism did not come to an end on the condemnation of its founder. Though Cyril and his party gained more and more the upper hand, and won over both the emperor and John of Antioch, Nestorius was succeeded in the see of Constantinople by Proclus, so that within a short time after the Council of Ephesus, the three great patriarchal sees of Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome were in the hands of opponents of Nestorianism. Great efforts were made to crush it, but some of the eastern bishops refused to be put down. Rabulus, bishop of Edessa, though himself a pupil of Theodore of Mopsuatia, joined Cyril in condemning the writings of Diodorus and Theodore, and expelled from the school of Edessa those teachers who were suspected of Nestorian leanings. But John of Antioch was opposed to blackening the memory of these distinguished Antiochians, and the emperor forbade the post-mortem condemnation of men who had departed in communion with the church. On the death of Rabulus in 435, Ibas, one of the teachers expelled from Edessa, and an avowed disciple of Theodore, became his successor. Some other of the banished teachers betook themselves to Persia, where, especially in Nisibis, the opinions of Theodore were held in high respect. These Persian Nestorians maintained an active intercourse with Edessa so long as Ibas ruled there. At a later date, under the emperor Zeno, the school of Edessa, the last stronghold of the Nestorians within the empire was destroyed. Its teachers for the most part took refuge under the more tolerant sway of Persia and founded there a church which was not in communion with the church of the empire. This body produced several men of learning and is not extinct even at this day. End of chapter 11, part 3. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers, O'Fallon, Missouri.